<laughs> freedom of thought, uncaged rage, so pure its end is forever, from forever, together, a philosophia. <laughs> Empezar. Oh yeah, sure. English is fine, I think. Could clouds be considered as a way of status function? In the way that we have clothes in order to protect ourselves from the, the cold weather, but at the same time, the clothes we wear can define if we are formal, if we are not informal, so... Oh, clothes? I couldn't hear it. Clothes. Yeah, what about clothes and fashion? Okay. Are they, uh, is Clothing performs a function of covering <coughs> the body. I never, thought, I, ne I never met a woman who thought that was the only function of clothing. Uh, and clothing is, among other things, a speech act. You express the sort of person you are. Uh, we think that we show our great originality in our clothing. In fact, uh, all the men here are wearing pretty much the same clothes, and the women have more variety, but still, it's a very serious limitation. <laughs> all the men here are in a uniform. It consists of trousers more like, like this, and I'm pleased to see the blue jeans are becoming international. I mean, they're now everywhere. Uh, I, I, it, many years ago, I made a lot of money in a bar in Budapest by selling my blue jeans. I had to have another pair of pants to wear uh, to the bartender, because in those days, uh, blue jeans made in San Francisco were very valuable behind the Iron Curtain. Okay, so uh, the clothing that we wear is a speech act. It expresses something about ourselves. It tells us something. Uh, it, it, it tells other people who you are and how you think of yourself. And it's amazing how uniform it is becoming. I mean, when I first moved to Oxford, I was amazed that the clothing they wore was totally different from the clothing in Madison, Wisconsin. Nobody wore blue jeans in Oxford. Everybody wore a tweed jacket and a necktie and gray flannel trousers and brown leather shoes. So uh, clothing is a beautiful example of something that performs a non-status function. It does keep you warm. But then um, numerous status functions are laid on top of that. And in particular, clothing becomes a form of self-expression. You say the sort of person you are, the sort of uh, a social background you have by the clothing you wear. And uh, over the world now, professors wear the same uniform. We all have on this uniform today. Uh, even in Beijing, uh, uh, this uniform is very common, uh, and especially in Shanghai, uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong, those are really almost Western cities. So uh, clothing uh, becomes more internationally conformist. That's too bad in a way, but it also is a good example of something that performs the function of a status function as well as just utilitarian function. Hmm. Lachikaki, just a little observation which is kind of funny. Jerry Seinfeld once remarked in one episode of the show Seinfeld yeah. that remarkably in all utopian science fiction movies, people wear uniforms. Yeah, yeah. This is That's a right. remarkable oh, right unification remarkable of humanity, but yeah, I think right. this might be. <laughs> what function yeah. do you think divinities and religion could take place or even having taken place during your moment? So what's the social function of religion and uh, All right. okay. uh, and the belief, belief in All the right. divine? Yeah. yeah, no, this is a very good uh, question. I wish I understood religion. I do not. Um, I, it's uh, very hard for me to take seriously the idea that all of this was created uh, in a space of seven days by a beneficent God, uh, and that when we die, we have uh, to look forward to uh, a heavenly existence, or in my case, the other place. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't believe any of that. I think it's, uh, uh, it lacks any basis whatever in what we know about the world. I mean, you see, the world is amazing if you even think about it a little bit. Our little solar system, there are a hundred million such systems 
in, in, the, in our galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy. A hundred million solar systems like ours. And how many galaxies are there? There are a hundred million galaxies. So we're the tiniest little tiny bit. We're not even suburban. You know, we're, we live in a village planet in a suburban galaxy, in a suburban solar system in a minor galaxy. The universe is huge. And it would seem to me incredible to suppose that given the uniformity of the laws of nature throughout, it would be incredible to suppose that the only living agents on our crummy little planet, uh, there must be all sorts of forms of life of which we have no idea. We can't even imagine them. If we, we would not have imagined kangaroos if we didn't discover them. Well, imagine something even crazier than the kangaroo, and you imagine a kind of life that probably exists. So it always strikes me as how provincial we are. We talk as if our little Earth was the whole universe. It's not. It's a minor little place, a grain of sand in, the, in, in a big galaxy. Uh, and there are, uh, as I said, a hundred million galaxies. So we have no idea what the possibilities of life are, but it would seem provincial and unintelligent to suppose the only forms of life are the ones we're aware of. Sí, 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 yo está rato. Eh, tenemos una célula y la célula tiene su conciencia y, y sin embargo no manda sobre mí, sino que soy yo quien mando sobre ellos porque tengo una conciencia a su vez. I hope you're going to understand. I, I, yeah, I will translate this. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, the, see, uh, okay, so, so the starting point is this, you know, he has a cell, he has cells in his body, obviously, yeah. and, uh, and for him now the question is how is it possible, this is where he starts, there's going to be more, I guess, that his consciousness uh, yeah. has any control over the actions of his cells, okay. right? I mean, yeah, he can, right. yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, watch, I'll show you ah. how it works. Ah, okay, see, you We are, Ah, sí. Él sigue empeñado y no se baja del burro de que el ser social no tiene autonomía propia. Ah, okay. So now the next question is: So, uh, what if we think of human individuals in the human society yeah. in this, uh, as cells of yeah. a bigger body? Yeah. And okay. if that's the case, uh, could there be a global mind at okay. all? Okay. Right? On, on this no. construct. No. Yeah. Two wonderful questions. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I will show you an amazing fact. I decide to raise my arm, and the damn thing goes up. <laughs> and notice, an important fact. I don't say, well, it's one of those days. You know, it's like rain in California. Some days she goes up, and other days she doesn't go up. It's up to me. I can raise it any time I like. <clears throat> How does it work? There are a series of neuron firings called my decision to raise my arm. They reach the motor cortex and they send a series of signals down the motor neurons that are always involve the secretion of the same neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. You think the mind cannot affect the body? Somebody says secrete acetylcholine at the axon end plates of your motor neurons or I'll blow your brains out. Ha! Huh. I just did it. I secreted, deliberately secreted acetylcholine at the axon end plates. The important thing is there aren't two systems. One, the mental system, my spirit decides that my arm should go up and miraculously the arm goes up. And secondly, the brain that decides to raise my arm. There's one system that has different levels of description. That's no more amazing than the fact that in my car there's a level of description where the spark plug fires and the engine turns over and the car moves. Then another level of description where I oxidize hydrocarbon molecules and, and release heat energy. T one system, two levels of description. In this one there's one system with two levels of description. So that 
That part does not seem to me a problem. How the mind and the body can affect each other, they're not two things. There's one thing with different levels of description, and that's no more mysterious than the car engine. I hope everybody understands that, because this is a source of massive confusion. People think, well, if the mind does exist, it couldn't have any effect on the world. But we know it does. I can raise my arm anytime I like. Okay, what was the other question? Yeah, and uh, uh, could, could we think of individuals oh, yeah, individual. as cells okay, of now, a bigger why aren't organism? We just, okay, no, that's a good question. Why aren't we all just cells in the great cosmic spirit? It sounds better in German, the cosmic Geist. Why are we not all just fragments of one universal Geist? I mean, I, some nonsense you have to say in German, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you an account of Geist in my okay. talk deliberately. All right, good, okay. <laughs> all right, now I want to say it's very simple. The way in which the cells interact to produce consciousness is quite different from the way human <coughs> organisms interact to produce collective intentionality. Watch the football team. Everybody's responsive to everybody else. They're all responding to each other, but it all works through their mind. It all works through consciousness. You're conscious of where the ball is, where the other players is, what you're doing, what they're trying to do. So it's not a case of a physiological transaction like uh, the, uh, the cells in my motor cortex respond to the uh, cells in the, in the uh, motor system, in the muscle system that produces my arm going up. It, it is a series of individual agents, each of which is a conscious agent. Now, if we found ways to join our brains to each other, well, that leaves all wonderful science fiction possibilities. Maybe we could produce a collective consciousness. We have no idea how to do that because we don't know how our individual brains produce consciousness. I know my brain does produce consciousness, but I don't know how it does it, and I don't know how to join my brain to your brain to produce a collective consciousness. We just don't know. We're ignorant. Maybe someday we will understand better, but right now we understand almost nothing about how the brain works to produce consciousness. So, the, so okay, uh, just a moment. So, the, uh, he has a question about animals and status yeah. functions. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> sí. Pero, uh, entonces, yo no entendí muy bien la, la cuestión. Entonces, sí. I, Okay, so, ah, okay, so, ah, so I see what you mean. Okay, so, but animals, if we use animals, if humans use, humans can use animals as status yeah. functions, right? Ah. I did, you want yeah. to repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so the, his question is, given that we can use yeah. uh, uh, rare animals yeah. in human social context, yeah. uh, or maybe even, you know, educated ordinary. dogs and yeah. so forth, right? I mean, yeah. uh, ordinary animals. Yeah. Does this not mean that we somehow incorporate animals into the system of status functions? Yes. And they yeah, might we do. Yeah. fully and, participate um, in the social system. Animals of the kind I'm familiar with, namely household pets, are private property. I, uh, my dogs have to be licensed in the city of Berkeley, and they, uh, you have to pay an annual fee for the license. That's a status function. I, I don't just own a dog. I own a licensed dog in the city of Berkeley, and if he's yes, not yes. licensed, he can be arrested. I mean, it's, a, it's not a trivial point. Yeah. So does, yeah, does the fact that we have status functions make us superior to an artificial intelligence? A real well, who knows, And could yeah. an artificial intelligence yeah. ever acquire a status function? Okay. No, no, that's two different questions. Okay. I, I, I am not <clears throat> interested in whether or not we are superior uh, to other uh, species 
uh, except in various technical ways. We have more uh, richer, more powerful languages than they have. But I'm not here to try to demonstrate our species is superior to other species. Who knows? I don't think it's, it's all that interesting a, a question. But we do have certain special, unusual features. And one is this capacity uh, to create <coughs> civilization, to create governments, property, money, marriage, cocktail parties, universities, summer vacations, and all these other things. And that, those have a structure. They have a logical, conceptual structure, and I'm trying to explore that. It's a typical philosopher's question. How does it work? How does this species of animal differ from other animals? And I think we do have interesting differences. What was the other part of the question? Yeah, so could, could artificial intelligence oh, yeah, could artificial intelligence, uh, uh, well, you know, okay, acquire it, status functions? It depends on what you mean by artificial intelligence. Now, in the early days, artificial intelligence meant producing digital computer programs which could simulate human intelligent <coughs> behavior and which could even pass the Turing test. I don't know if you know the Turing test, but the Turing test was invented by Alan Turing. And the idea was that if the expert can't distinguish the computer's behavior from the human behavior, then you have to say the computer has the same mental capacities. <coughs> as uh, the expert, as a human does. Now, I want to say that is decisively refuted by the Chinese room, because on the hypothesis of the Chinese room, the computer passes the Turing test. It answers questions in Chinese, but it doesn't understand a word of Chinese. The Turing test enshrined behaviorism. It says if it behaves intelligently, it is intelligently. And what the Chinese room shows is the simulation of intelligence is not the real thing. Simulation is not duplication. There are two slogans that underlie the Chinese room. Syntax is not semantics. The syntax of the computer program is not the semantics of human understanding. And simulation is not duplication. You do not duplicate human cognition by doing a computer simulation. Now, people have always said to me, yes, but suppose you actually could carry out the steps. Well, wouldn't we say that you understood Chinese? Well, if you actually try it, let's suppose I'm in the Chinese room and I'm given a Chinese symbol that looks like this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Now, this will be in a dialect of Chinese some of you won't recognize. Okay. <laughs> this is a Chinese symbol that means, do you understand Chinese? Okay, I look up what I'm supposed to do with this symbol, and I give back another symbol in the same dialect. And this one means, why do you ask me such dumb questions? Can't you see I can understand Chinese? Okay, so I get this one as input and this one as output, and any Chinese speaker would say, well, we asked him if he understood Chinese, and he answered, yes, I understand Chinese. Doesn't that prove it? proves nothing. This is just syntax. All I have done is manipulate symbols. It's not a weakness of the computer that all it can do is manipulate symbols. That's its power. You don't have to worry. Is its feelings being hurt by the fact that I ask it some dumb questions? Or is it annoyed that I left it on all night last night? Because it doesn't have any feelings, it doesn't have any thoughts, it only has syntax. That's the power of the computer, it manipulates symbols. Usually thought of as zeros and ones, but anything will do, including Chinese symbols. Okay. So, recent <coughs> research showed that whales can assign certain sound patterns to certain individuals. Whales. Yeah, it's a question whales. about whale language. Yeah, whales. Yeah, yeah. We all love whales. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but what do you want to know yeah. about? Yeah. So that, um, <laughs> um, it's been proven that they can assign certain sound patterns, right? so mm -hmm. to say names, to certain individuals within the community. So in a sense, that is status function. Yeah. Um, and even language. Is that necessarily leading to a 
whale civilization, so to say? Mm. So he thinks, uh, you know, whales uh, have the use of proper names for individuals, yeah. and uh, this might be evidence that they assign status functions. So well, is there be. whale society? Yeah, yeah I, I have no uh, uh, special knowledge of <clears throat> other species. If it turns out that whales have an elaborate system of government and even income tax and so on, welcome to the club. Uh, that's not my, I have no objection to that. But as far as we know, the only species that has uh, human style languages is the human species. <coughs> and there are two properties of human languages which are truly remarkable. Uh, one which impresses me especially is compositionality. If you know the words, you can understand sentences you've never heard before. If I now say, I once drank three gallons of ketchup sitting on top of Mount Everest, I venture to say, you never heard that sentence before, you'll never hear it again, but you understand it perfectly. It's an English sentence. You, if you saw it in a poem or in a short story, you'd think, well, not a very good short story. But in <laughs> any case, you understand sentences you've never heard before. That's a remarkable capacity. Now another feature, and Chomsky makes a lot of this, is sentences have, English language has, or natural languages have recursive rules, rules that you can apply over and over to the output of the rules. And that gives you the capacity for constructing an infinite number of sentences. Now I think of those two, it's compositionality which is the key, your capacity to understand new sentences. But I think those two, generativity and compositionality, they are essential to human languages. And I, I, you wouldn't have a, anything like a human language if you didn't have those two. It is a remarkable fact that you understand sentences you've never heard before and you'll never hear again, and sentences which involve all kinds of complex embedding. So there's always the professor who will start a sentence and then something will occur to her in the middle of the sentence and she will to continue to evolve the sentence until it evolves into other sentences and those still other sentences. You, you get the picture. This is why it makes it hard to take lecture notes in some university courses. But in any case, human language is special. If other animals have it, welcome to the club. It's just I don't know for a fact of any languages that have compositionality and generativity in the way that human languages do. The B language has a little bit of compositionality, but not much. I mean, not, it's nothing like uh, English or Spanish. Sí, sí, ok, so now, yeah, yeah, so that's, it's a, uh, sí, entonces la pregunta es... La cuestión es, eh, hasta lo que yo sé, usted es un filósofo karmatista, es decir, es un filósofo que apunta a las personas, a los cuerpos que están aquí. No obstante, de lo que está hablando no es del cuerpo, está hablando constantemente del lenguaje y está suponiendo que de alguna forma, o quizá yo me equivoco, pero está suponiendo que existe la capacidad de expresar cualquier idea que tengamos. Y yo quiero preguntarle, si usted piensa que esto es así, ah, sí. y por otro lado preguntarle cuál es el papel de la violencia simbólica, de las distintas violencias. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So his question is, how much uh, 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 of what you say about uh, uh, human sociality and its relation to language yeah. relies on the idea that uh, humans fundamentally are able to express their thought linguistically. Yeah. So does this, you know, this is the kind yeah. of uh, worry about this ontology yeah. that, uh, uh, that assumes that too many things have to be explicit. But the human body, so that's the question, the human body has all sorts of non-conscious processes and yeah. levels on which we communicate yeah. with other human beings yeah. that seem to be social but do not, never raise, rise to the level of explicit uh, awareness or linguistic yeah. coding. Uh, well, see? okay. Yeah, I, I think it's a very good point and there is in human communication a great deal of body language of which we are for the most part unaware, we're unconscious of the various ways in which our expressive behavior uh, facilitates communication. Um, and you remember La Rochefoucauld said very few people would ever fall in love if they never read about it. 
And nowadays we'd have to add, if they never saw it on television or uh, 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 in the movies or something like that. So even basic emotions like falling in love are heavily linguistically constituted. However, there are limits. Uh, and indeed, if you think body language is good for communicating, uh, try to communicate Joyce's Ulysses just with body language, just by, or, or even simple poems uh, like uh, um, uh, 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 Eliot's, any poem by Eliot, uh, just by making gestures. You can't do it. Yeah, human language ha has remarkable expressive powers, which you don't get in, in facial expressions or body language, valuable as they are. Ah, sí, 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 en el resto, sí. Te ha dicho enamorarse, pero enamorarse, enamorarse no, no creo yo que sea una emoción ni mucho menos universal, ni sea algo que podamos aprender, es que es algo puramente cultural, o sea, es decir, sí, requerimos un lenguaje para comprender lo que es el enamoramiento, pero también para tener una teoría crítica de lo que sea enamorarse, requerimos un lenguaje, la cuestión es que nada de esto nos habla de cómo los cuerpos son afectados por otros cuerpos, no sé si me explico. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, uh, oh, okay, so I think in a certain sense he's trying to push a more naturalistic line on some of those social uh, uh, objects such as, or activities such as falling in love. Yeah. So he thinks it might be much more bodily. So maybe on the model of, right, I mean, transmitting uh, certain smells like the chemical basis of falling in love and so forth. Well, so, yeah. you know, like how is, how is human sociality maybe, no? So, um, sí. Puramente cultural. Ah. ah, bueno, sí. Okay, so basically his worry is that language might not play such a big role in the constitution of human society, not because there are natural factors, but uh, some other factors. Well, the it's a possibility. You ah. know, the factual question, I, I recommend the investigation. Ah. And it would ought to be possible to design experiments. My experience is that many human emotions require language. Uh, you can't suffer the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism if you can't talk. <clears throat> you have to be able to talk to, I don't know how to say the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism in Spanish, but that I think is something Neither better than the language. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I saw, yes. Quería ver si el profesor me podría aclarar un poco mis, mis dudas y mi ignorancia sobre la función de estatus, ¿no? Okay. Primero me parece un poco un oxímoron, ¿no? Porque función dinámico y estatus como algo fijo, ¿no? Ah. El estar muriéndose sería una, pregunto yo, si sería una función de estatus, un moribundo, una ah, función okay. de estatus. Okay. Pero esa función de estatus sería interpretada diferentemente por el que se está muriendo, si está asustado, si está sufriendo, por los que lo están asistiendo, sí. el médico, si encuentra frustración porque el paciente se le está muriendo, mm. por sus familiares sí. que no quieren que se vaya, o los herederos que sí quieren que, que mm -hmm. se vaya, ¿no? Okay, so, so his question is um, whether the concept of a status function to him sounds a little bit paradoxical because the concept of a function uh, yeah. in society could be something very dynamic. Yeah. His example is this, so someone is dying yeah. and now there are the perspectives of the family, of the moribund person yeah. and of the doctor. Yeah. And uh, so there's this function of being, you know, in the process of dying yeah. in hospital, say, and now different dynamic interactions of interpretation. Yeah. Whereas the concept of the, uh, now you can assign an official social status to this person, right, yeah. and which is what the health insurance would do, but then he thinks there might be a tension between this social status aspect of the facts and the dynamic nature of the functions, yeah. and he wants to understand how this hangs together, what we, yeah. as no, if we're fixed no, in language no. and the dy social dynamics yeah. underlying yeah. our... It's yeah. a very good question, and the only way to answer it in terms of detailed examination of specific examples. Now, most of us are involved in status functions that define our existence. I am a professor. I, uh, many of you are married. You're a husband or a wife. And those are status functions that affect all sorts of aspects of your life. 
uh, in Berkeley, California. The status of being a professor uh, is an extremely complex status that relates you not just to the university, but to the commercial operations in the town, to buying and selling real estate. It's easier to buy a house if you're a professor uh, because the real estate people think you have a guaranteed lifetime income. They're mistaken about that, but they think that anyway. So all of these status functions, or many of the status functions, are produce extremely complicated social relations that affect all aspects of your life. Okay, see, sí, más una. Sí, sí claro. Eh, yo vi al, al profesor Ser en 1987 en Madrid. Sí, lo vi en 87 en Madrid. I think in a group he mentioned this with Davidson and Nicholas Luhmann. Ah. Bueno, eh, de entonces ahora, con la incorporación de Internet, Okay, so that's okay. So yeah, yeah. Last time he saw you speak was in '87 in Madrid with uh, Davidson and Habermas yeah. and Nicholas Luhmann. Apparently, he has I a think. Good I think memory. Yeah, and um, and uh, now, uh, but uh, since '87, we have the phenomenon of the internet. So he wants to know if the internet has influenced uh, your philosophical thinking. Well, it has made it uh, more difficult to resist. Uh, objections, uh, especially unintelligent objections from outside, because every time you turn on the computer, there are a whole lot of people refuting the Chinese room. I got so sick of people uh, attacking the Chinese room that I just stopped reading those. So the internet <laughs> facilitates uh, uh, communication enormously. But there are people who think, no, the internet changes our whole mode of existence. Not, not mine. A uh, car is much more important to me than the computer. But that may be, you know, I like cars. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, but that may be idiosyncratic. That may not be true of everybody. Mm. Aquí, sí. Yeah, so what about a, a man-machine interaction system, you know, like a human uh, and a computer? Yeah, well, yeah. what about it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, uh, there are people who are naturally good at computers, and people like me who always make a mess of things. Uh, but I still use a computer. Uh, if I ask what difference does a computer make, well, email is a tremendous difference. <laughs> I, I am in touch with people all over the world, many of whom I wish I was not in touch with. But anyway, <laughs> there's no escaping. I, the fact that I dread opening my email because there will be a whole lot of letters I wish I didn't have to answer. But you, you're always uh, faced with that. So it's like any tool. It's just it's more pervasive in different aspects of our life because you can leave the car in the garage, uh, but with a computer, even if you leave it off, there's still email coming in, still all <laughs> kinds of messages coming in. Sí. Actos de habla. Es el, uh, sí, esa es su teoría, ¿no? Bueno, so. ok, bueno. Ok, oh, sí. So he wants to know, at the beginning of your talk, he thought that uh, you were looking at language uh, paradigmatically through its representational function. Yeah. But then, uh, uh, going deeper in your talk, it clarified to him that this is not the picture. So he just wants to know a little bit more, basically, about your take on the relation between the representational and the social function of language. Yeah. Okay. Uh. All right. Well, this, uh, as you know, is really another lecture. Uh, but let, uh, let me <coughs> say a few things about it. I, many philosophers talk as if there are an infinite number of things you can do with language. That's not true. Wittgenstein said that the use of language are unzählige, countless. <coughs> uh, I think if we're talking about the basic structure of the speech act, there are a limited number of things you can do, and these are limitations set by the nature of mind and meaning. There are only so many things you can do by using words 
uh, to relate to reality. And specifically, in, uh, in human languages, you can tell people how things are. I call those assertives. I, you can try to get them to do something, directives. You can commit yourself to doing something, like promising, commissives. You express your feelings and attitudes, what I call expressives. And finally, you have this remarkable capacity where you can change reality by representing as being changed, what I call declarations. And uh, an implicit thesis in my talk is that all of institutional reality, money and governments and properties and marriages and universities and elections, all of those are created by declaration. Uh, the guy who's president of the United States is president of the United States because we have represented him as being president. That is, we have, in effect, declared him to be president. Officially, he was declared also. But the declaration plays a crucial role in creating social reality. So there aren't an infinite number of things you can do with language. I can't fry an egg by saying, I hereby fry the egg. No, <laughs> nothing happens to the egg. <laughs> but I can adjourn the meeting by saying, I hereby adjourn the meeting if I am the appropriate authority. So you can do all sorts of things with language, but they all have to do with a relation of representation and reality. Some realities you can change by representing them as being changed, that's declarations. But you can't do anything. You can't cure cancer by saying, I hereby cure cancer. You can't get rich by saying, I hereby get rich. Uh, you have to uh, talk, uh, tie it to other features of reality. So language is an enormously powerful instrument, but it's not infinite. There are five and only five things you can do with language, and I've tried to describe those in various writings. Aquí? Sí. Sí, sí, sí. So let's imagine we had two people, and one person is a real one, and the other one is a machine. But the machine imitates the person and recognizes the same states and functions, everything like a normal person. And the machine wouldn't be perfect because we aren't perfect either, so it would be the same. Would you say that the machine is a person as well, a human being, or not? What was the question? Okay, so you have a uh, you have a you know, like, okay. so you have a really perfect, I mean, completely indistinguishable, uh, uh, say a, a robot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you have a robot, and for all sakes and purposes, even though it's clearly you know you're aware it's a robot and yeah. so forth, it's not the Turing test. Yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah, it's more like Japan. So you yeah. have a robot, and the robot is actually part of human society. Yeah. Would you say that the robot is a full member of human society or not? Well, uh, uh, to answer that, we want to know, is it conscious? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, this device does a whole lot of things, uh, but it's yeah, not like conscious. Like Siri, yeah. yeah. And the, that's the crucial question. Yeah. We don't know how to make a conscious robot. So if we, if we have a robot, that behaves that it actually were uh, a human being, we might be deceived. But under present robotics technology, we don't know how to make a conscious robot. Hmm. Now, suppose we could. Suppose we could make a robot that looked exactly like you uh, and what had the same kind of consciousness you have, then I would say we build a duplicate of you. I mean, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't build an artificial human. It's just that existing technology is wrong because it doesn't try to duplicate the capacity of human organic substance. It tries to simulate human cognition on a digital computer. And that's useful, but it doesn't create an artificial human. Mm -hmm. There's no obstacle in principle to creating an artificial human. But to do that, you have to duplicate and not just simulate the, cognitive, the causal capacities of the human structure, particularly the brain. We don't know how to do that. We don't know how the brain works, so we don't know how to build an artificial brain. Hmm. Sí. Entonces, la conciencia es una presuposición, según John Searle, la conciencia es un fenómeno biológico producido por el cerebro. Y este, este fenómeno natural en el, en el universo es la precondición para la existencia de una inteligencia y de un comportamiento inteligente, social, etc. Es decir, un, un robot que, que no tiene materia biológica con la forma de un cerebro no puede jamás participar 
en la sociedad humana. Eso es siempre su idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she wants to yeah, yeah. some more. Yeah, well, her English is perfect, but I just wanted to give everyone right. just a very okay. short update. On okay, all right. Good. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So imagine the robot or the machine <coughs> has a brain as well, but it's yeah. like, it's, yeah, it's like a machine, right? Yeah, Dalek. You, you bring the, Dal the Daleks in Doctor Who. Does everyone know the Daleks? Okay. Uh. What, what is she, what's the question? Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so imagine the robot or the machine has a brain as well, but it's like, Well, I don't think so, but uh, okay, so imagine like there's this great TV show, Doctor Who, an American BBC show. But uh, so in Doctor Who, there are killer robots. Yeah. And all they have, the only biological matter in them is a brain, a nervous yeah. system. So apart from that, they're just tanks. Are they, uh, are they conscious? I'm, yes, would you say that they could be conscious? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, consciousness is produced by very specific mechanisms. This is a very intelligent machine, but it's not conscious because it's got the wrong mechanisms. <coughs> Consciousness is a, a complex process produced in the brain. Uh, we think that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the connection between the cortex and the basal parts of the brain is essential, but we don't know how it works. As far as I know, the cerebellum plays very little role in producing consciousness, but the uh, uh, thalamocortical system is essential for consciousness. That's just a fact about how nature works. We don't know how to duplicate it artificially because we don't know how it works in nature. Mm. But in principle, yes, I think you would totally agree yeah, that you could sure. build a Dalek, if you had not, not as presented in the TV show, but if you knew how, what produces consciousness yeah. in the human animal, then in principle you could build a Dalek. If you can duplicate the causes, you duplicate the effects. That's the secret. If you knew how to produce the causes of consciousness, you would produce consciousness. Ah, sì. Ultima question. So I think he wants to know what would happen if you could, uh, you know, immediately surf the internet with your brain. So if you have like a brain internet interface, say, uh, yeah. w w would you think that this fundamentally would change the human mind? Well, it depends we on the thing? type of connection. Uh, uh, if you had my brain connected with a system <coughs> which would increase my cognitive capacities so I could speak any natural human language, then that would be an amazing change. Uh, but we don't have that. We don't know how to do that. Bueno, entonces, eh, muchas gracias al Profesor Sell.